What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I am incredibly excited as we have a new, what I believe is going to be recurring guest here on Fridays. That is the one and only Mike Wall, former Green Bay Packers guard, absolutely legendary Green Bay Packer. And I am so excited to be able to talk to you each week. In most instances, Mike and I are going to be talking more about game film and doing game recaps in that capacity. However, We've got a ton to get to that is not game film related, but Mike, first of all, welcome to the show. So excited to have you on. Hey, thanks for having me. And just, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, certainly. And uh, you're, you're right about having a lot to talk about today because it's been, it's been a crazy 24 hours. It, it certainly has been. And let's just start there. And I don't want to spend a ton of time going over the entire Rogers COVID stuff, because I think probably everyone's already at overkill with it. But of course, it is an incredibly big topic still. And really where I kind of wanted to get your mindset is, How can this affect the locker room? You have a team that was clicking on all cylinders, won seven games in a row, seven and one, huge win against an undefeated Arizona Cardinals team on primetime Thursday night football. You are on cloud nine. You're expected to get Devontae Adams back, maybe David Bakhtiari soon. Everything is going swimmingly. And then all of a sudden, the brakes are slammed. Aaron Rodgers tests positive for COVID. There's certainly drama that surrounds that. He's going to miss the game in Kansas City. You've got you know, a quarterback making his first start. How does that affect the locker room? And how can that moment is momentum a real thing in this scenario that can kind of be paused? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think first and foremost, when you just look at it from a player perspective, you're losing the MVP. So that's going to be a huge deal regardless. And the teams now are ready for the impact of losing a key player. I mean, they, they lost Devontae Adams last week. I'm talking about the teams across the NFL, though. I mean, people are losing key players in key moments. Right. Um, the fact that they're playing an AFC opponent is actually a great thing for the Packers. Because if he's just losing this one game, if you lose to an AFC opponent, the Chiefs aren't playing. Listen, we can go and win this game. I know the spread went up like – I went to like eight and a half. I think it's been down to seven and a half or something. But realistically, they can go in and win this game. The Chiefs aren't playing very well. The Chiefs' defense is porous at, at right. best. And so there's – and we just have playmakers all over the boards, and we have a great offensive line. So it, it seems like we could still put some points on the board. It just might be come down to who's making the most plays. But when you look at it just from a Packer perspective, an AFC game, so non-conference, how's that going to affect – given the fact that you're going to have, I think, nine games after this to kind of make up that ground if you, if you, if you fall to seven and two – so I don't think it's this could this couldn't happen at a better time given the scenario. Having said that, with the locker room, I f- it's tough. I think this is this is a tough one because I just wonder. You, you look at you know you look at around the league. You look at Carson Wentz. You look at Kirk Cousins. You look at Kyrie Irving in the NBA, and yeah. people are just getting raked over the coals for what for what their the position is on it. But they've been honest about it. I just wonder from a locker room perspective because there's one thing, Andy, that that everybody in the NFL knows, and it's that special players get special treatment. Special players get special treatment. There's things that apply to me that don't apply to the quarterback of the football team. You just know that. And I'm talking about at a league level. Yeah. But I just wonder, given the fact that the, the COVID vaccination has been such a hot topic with every single locker room because of different, you know, people in, from different backgrounds, different demographics, not everybody wants to have that uh, we get the shot. And so I just wonder how many people now are going, well, I didn't even know that he wasn't vaccinated and he's been walking around this place. I mean, that, that to me is actually, that sounds like a big deal to me. That feels, it just feels different. It feels like there's some dishonesty there that could be at maybe even the player level that I do think is a problem. Now, does that really matter long-term as, or is that, does that matter in, in the context of hey, this is my quarterback and, and he's the reigning MVP and he's Aaron Rodgers and we're going to go try to win some games. I don't think for this season it really matters as it ma- as it pertains to kind of long term. It, it just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right to me. This 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 one's a little bit different. Yeah, it is. It is certainly a tricky situation and circumstance. And I think what we don't have great clarity on is it seems like Green Bay knew. It seems like the NFL knew. Did the players know? It sounds like Rodgers followed all protocols, save for maybe the the mask in the press conferences. So you would you would think that maybe the players knew in some capacity, but there's still the Halloween parties and all those sort of things. So it's tough to tell at this point what the players right. knew, what they didn't know, um, and how this could certainly affect that. I you know going back to your point about special trade, you know, players with special treatment, the, the, you know, the, the statement that resonates with me is when I 
I took a coaching course actually. And they said, you know, treat everyone fairly. Don't necessarily treat everyone equally. If you treat everyone equally, you got to give everyone the same exact stuff. Well, I can get around that by saying, I'm going to treat this person fairly. That doesn't mean that they get equal treatment to everyone else. But this is a, a unique situation and circumstance where it's not just a, a player of, of Roger's stature and obviously the talent that he has on the field, but when he is a leader of the football team and even this decision potentially could cost games, him not getting vaccinated could cost him an additional game. Like there's a, an opportunity where if he was vaccinated, maybe he could, he could have been back for Kansas City and maybe mm -hmm. he would have been back quicker against Seattle. We'll still see he could still be back against Seattle, but those are things that affect the team and wins and losses and trying to navigate a season that you know is already going to be tricky and has a tough schedule and everything like that. That's where I wonder if, you know, if, if everyone's still going to rally around this, which I think they probably will, but it just, when you had all of that positive momentum and when you had everything, okay. even, even with all the injuries, everything was sort of coming up aces for you, especially in the win loss record. It just seems to put a little bit of a screeching halt on that a little bit. Yeah, it, it does. But at the same time, you just, you're probably going through the season going, realistically, we don't think we're going to be 16 and one. You know, we probably think we're going to be a couple of bumps along the road. You know, you, you always look at the NFL season, you're trying to build momentum, but it's not a straight line, right? There's, there's, there's peaks and valleys and you want to just have higher highs and higher lows every single week. And so if you're going to drop a game or two, again, the fact that it's in the AFC is a big deal. It's, it's more to me, it's, it's, you know, most, for the most part, players in a locker room are kind of, they're going to, they get a set of rules. They have a routine that they follow. They kind of do what they're told to some extent. Right? Everybody's an independent thinker, but they under, they understand like most of the rules that are put in place are put in place for the best for the for the team, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's the when you talk about momentum. I don't know. There's I always look at it like this. There's always a, there's always a handful of players in every locker room who think they're on that level, but they're not, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's those. It's it's sometimes it's those guys. Who, you're, who are a little bit like, well, wait a second, what's going on here, right? And then you, you just don't want, what you don't want in these situations is for people to start talking, like the, that locker room talk, like you and I are sitting next to each other in the locker room and we're just kind of mumbling under our voices about how we don't like this situation and then it builds, it builds, it builds. I don't think it happens in that locker room. They've been dealing with this stuff with Aaron Rodgers since the off season. Is he going to play? Is he going to play? All the press conferences, all the, you know, sleight of hand with with the way that he's approached this, this whole Brian Gutekind's situation. So I think they're used to dealing with him. I think this is just, again, it just feels a little bit different, but like you said, in, in the short term, I really don't see this affecting them from a momentum standpoint. I think he comes back next week and they're just ready to go. Let me ask you this. Is there ever anything like the, the season? I know it's only at year time was 16 games. Now it's 17 games, but it still is. It feels like a long season. And when you're going week to week, and I'm sure it's even longer as a player, does anything like this actually break up the monotony at all and sort of change things up and bring a dip? Like all of a sudden Jordan Love is starting there. I'm, maybe that changes things. Like, I feel like last week against Arizona, you could tell that that team rallied with all the guys that they were missing and they win a big game in Arizona despite missing all those people. It almost felt like it was a rallying moment and, and it, it was almost breaking up the monotony of a we're doing the same thing over and over and over can this, I'm not saying it's a benefit. Let's not mm -hmm. like sugarcoat it and say Aaron Rodgers being out is going to be a benefit, but can that change up the mindset a little bit for players? Well, certainly what you're trying to do is create a narrative every week. The coach is trying to create a narrative every week. And so you have a narrative now, especially with Jordan Love playing his first game. The narrative is not going to be about Aaron missing the game. It's going to be about Jordan Love and that opportunity and what we have to do to rally around him. Playing against a great offensive team, Patrick Mahomes, all the things that come with that, all the weapons that they have. So creating that narrative is very, that's one of the head coach's main jobs, really is to keep people engaged. We keep people present week to week. And so creating that narrative this week is a little bit easier than it is maybe in week nine of other seasons. So from that perspective, yeah, absolutely. Guys are going to be dialed in. That's a great point. It kind of brings us to the next question is, is what, do, what do the rest of the players on this team need to do to step up in Aaron Rodgers' absence? Matt LaFleur constantly talks about just doing your 111th and doing your job. I'm sure there can be almost a, a feeling of I need to do more because Aaron Rodgers is out this week, but is it as simple as just executing the game plan and going out and playing your game? Or do you, you know, do players try to overcompensate for a player like Aaron being out? Well, I think it usually depends on how the game's going. You always go in just understanding, you know, following the coach's game plan, which is, you know, be that, be that, you know, one out of 11, do your job. You know, so, you know, Bill Belichick's made it so famous. Just, Hey, what's our motto? Do your job. Yep. And so <clears throat> I don't think that's necessarily an issue 
when you go into the game. I don't think people are trying to reach, especially when you are as competent offensively and defensively as the Packers have been over the last maybe four or five weeks. Right. And so what you what you really start looking at is when you get into the middle of the game, if you see the Kansas City Chiefs, regardless if Rodgers is playing or not, usually you see this from the quarterback, right? Like Brett Favre, you know, we're playing against the St. Louis Rams in the playoffs and they're just dropping points every time we get in or the Indianapolis Colts with Manning dropping points every time we get in. Now the quarterback starts reaching. He's the one with the ball a little bit. Right. So a lot of, I think from a player's perspective, what you really need to do is just, hey, listen, the margin for error always goes down when your best player leaves. So it's not that we have to do more. We just always talk about, you know, you don't fall to, you don't rise to the occasion to fall to the lowest level of your training. You know, the Greek philosopher Archilochus said that thousands of years ago now. We want to just make sure our preparation is such that our margin for error, we understand that it's shrinking and we just want to play to our highest capacity. No, that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, like you said, the, the margin for error, much, much less in a get situation. You know, if you get down by 14, it's going to be tougher to, to climb out of that hole with Jordan than it would be maybe with Aaron. So that certainly makes a ton of sense in, in with that mindset being the case. And with Jordan being the quarterback this week, I'm going to ask you to maybe put yourself in Matt LaFleur's shoes. How would you build a game plan for Jordan Love this week, knowing that you know Kansas City's defense isn't great, but you do have to deal with a ton of crowd noise. It's a really tough atmosphere to play in. Um, and you're making your very first start. I would assume that you don't want to put too much on his plate too quickly, but you also want to go out and execute your offense. Right. So I think just look back to the Cincinnati game. It was feast or famine, right? So and what happened in that game? We had a lot of dropbacks and we had a lot of deep developing plays. Yep. And you see, when I, when I think of the Green Bay Packers, I think of a really efficient game plan. In other words, they're running the ball a lot and they're using a lot of the play fakes, the motions to get the ball out of the, the quarterback's hands quickly. Ball's getting into your playmaker's hands, either at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage, or within five yards. Devontae Adams is making one guy miss and getting, getting those first downs. And we're moving the sticks. We're very efficient. And so I would tend to try to build out a game plan where we're using motion, making the Kansas City Chiefs, who are not doing a good job of communicating, making them do, an, make them do a lot of pre-snap communicating, um, and then try to get the ball out of his hands, put the ball in the hands of your playmakers, and just understand – Jordan Love's been there now for a, a full season and, and then some. He probably has a very good command of the playbook. So I don't know if we're going to take a lot of things away. The only thing that probably changes from a game plan perspective is Aaron Rodgers has the ability to make changes at the line of scrimmage. Whereas Jordan Love, you can go into the game and it's very easy to go, hey, we have a we have a blue-green play here. We have a we have a, a, a run pass, or we have a strong weak run with maybe a smoke route on the outside, right? And right. we just want to make, you're going to do A or B. We're not going to give you A or, you know, B through Z. So I think that's probably the only difference. I think everything else, you just kind of open up and keep it. He can make all the all the throws. He understands the, the offense. And again, it's just a question of look historically where we've been really good. And it's when the ball's coming out fast. When you get the, when you get the ball into the, our playmaker's hands, especially now Devontae's coming back, and we have those two guys in the backfield. AJ Dillon played his life, his the game of his life last week. I thought maybe yeah, not from awesome. a not, maybe not from a number standpoint, but I just love the way he played. He really came into his own. So you have two weapons in the backfield. You have a lot going on. I love the new tight ends, the way that they block, along with Mercedes Lewis now bringing in the young guys. So I just think they have a, a really really solid game plan against the Kansas City Chiefs on the offensive side of the ball. We just don't need to overload them with like pre snap decisions. No, it makes a ton of sense. I, I love that game from Dylan as well, especially coming off a game where he had two fumbles, one loss the week mm -hmm. before. You always wonder how a player is going to respond from that. He responded phenomenal, uh, ran hard, ran angry, probably upset over those two fumbles the week before, but uh, he probably enjoyed having to be a short week and, and being able to quickly get over that as well. But he ran fantastic. Um, you know, th there's so much to kind of go over here, but I, I want to kind of touch base on that, that, that Jordan love of maybe not giving him too much and putting too much on his plate. One of the things that I'm really intrigued by here is this is not a knock on, on Rogers in any way, shape or form. It's obviously a, a positive that he can do so much at the line of scrimmage, but I do feel like what we end up with sometimes is a half hybrid Matt LaFleur, Aaron Rodgers offense where Rodgers is doing so much at the line and doing some of the stuff. You know, he'll even say from time to time that he's checking to a play from, you know, six or seven years ago that maybe only Devonte Adams knows I think we're going to get a much clearer look at potentially what a Matt LaFleur 
fully function 100% offense looks like. Now, again, that's not to say that that's better because I know Aaron can make some bad calls look really good with not only his pre-snap checks, but also his post-snap ability to make plays and do those sort of things. But um, I am really intrigued to see how these plays flow together and how Matt LaFleur kind of structures this offense. And I think we're going to get a really good grasp of exactly what that looks like when there isn't a ton of plays changing on a really a play-to-play basis. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. I think Matt Lafleur, since he walked in here, he's he's made it known that Aaron Rodgers is a special player, and he has certain freedoms that most other quarterbacks wouldn't have. Right. So, you know, we've probably seen those games that you're referencing. We just we just don't know what we don't know as far as what goes on at the line of scrimmage. True. But yeah, I think it will be interesting to see. Um, again, against the you know, you go into this from Matt Lafleur's standpoint, you're going, okay, the Kansas City Chiefs have the potential to go off at any point and drop forty. Right. They haven't been playing great, but they do have that potential. Our defense is starting to play better. We're starting to get in the groove. Um, but we might have to we might have to score 28, 35 points to win this game. So what does that look like? How is how is that game plan work out? Is it going to be something like last week where, hey, we're going to eat up a ton of clock. They're not going to have a lot of plays on the other side of the ball. And we're just going to continue to get those first downs. Can we run that kind of offense? And can I make that work? I thought last week for the Arizona Cardinals game, that was the game where I was like, man, this Matt LaFleur is a really smart coach. And I'm sure a lot of people have got there way before I did, but I just thought last week their game plan, the way they executed it, and part of that has to do with Aaron being on the same page, but the way they executed their game plan and just took care of the football and just, you know, third down and one, okay, we're just going to put it in so-and-so's hands and, and or Dylan's hands and, and, and bust it through for a first down. Like there's, we didn't take those risks and those chances probably because of personnel, but that's why I thought it was such a masterful game plan. And, and so Matt's got like, I think he's just he was kind of sort of ascending as far as coaching ranks go. I think he just ascended to that next level, at least for me, in the way that he he masterminded that victory in Arizona. So I'm just, you know, I'm always looking forward to seeing what the next thing looks like. Agree. I, I think he's a phenomenal coach. And I think he showed that again last week. But you bring up a really great and interesting point in the fact that they had a very efficient game plan last week, ball control offense, keeping it out of Arizona's hands. And it really worked well. And obviously a, a huge reason for doing that is you didn't have MVS. You didn't have Devonte Adams. You didn't have Alan Lazard. You probably, you didn't want to get into a shootout with Arizona. You didn't want to go, you know, all right, we're going to both put up 40 some points because you don't have your full arsenal of weapons on offense. But if you can get into a, you know, drag out, you know, uh, running game brawl with uh, the Cardinals. Yeah. You feel probably much better about that. And Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon were able to control that game and control the clock. And they did it so efficiently. I think efficiency is going to be a huge part of this game as well. We know turnovers are going to be a huge factor, but yeah, if you can keep Pat Mahomes in that offense, you know, off the field and you can control the ball and not have to have Jordan Love, same thing, get into a 40 point shootout with Patrick Mahomes, you give yourself a much better chance. So I think almost a, a similar game plan from a week ago, because you probably have your receivers this week, but don't have your quarterback could actually work to Green Bay's advantage. Yeah. And if you look at it from an offensive line perspective, they have Frank Clark, uh, D Ford's been, you know, in and out and they've been lining up Chris Jones at the defensive end position until they get into third down. They just finally started bringing him back in, which hasn't made any sense at all. Right. But it's kind of the same makeup from the, from, as the Arizona Cardinals. The Arizona Cardinals were good on the edges, not that powerful up front as, as in, the, in the inside of the defensive tackle position as far as being able to push the pocket, have great pass rushers. Um, and their, their, their strength was more speed than it was power through the middle. So we were able to kind of dominate the middle of the field. And I think we can do the same thing this week, if there's, and especially if they're going to keep Chris Jones out of left defensive end. It just makes our lives a lot easier from an interior line perspective. You know, we've been cycling through players. We have some new errors maybe coming back this week, but we have some young guys playing in there, and they, they've been doing a great job. But that certainly allows us to dictate the terms of confrontation more because now we have we do have the outside runs with Mercedes Lewis being able to block on the, on the edge, one of the best blocking tight ends in the history of the NFL. But now if we can dominate the middle of the line of scrimmage, it just really opens up that playbook. And like you said, it allows you to be more efficient. So I, I think if I was, if it was me, I, the, the full arsenal of our run game at least is going to be available for this, for this game, just because of where their strengths and weaknesses are. I want I want to follow up on that because as an offensive lineman, I want to, I want to get your thoughts is when you're watching Mercedes Lewis do what he does as a mm -hmm. blocker, both as a pass blocker and a run blocker, mm -hmm. it is in my opinion, super rare to see a tight end have that sort of ability as a blocker, as a, as a former offensive lineman, do you just have a, such a high level of respect for what he can do? And are you just in awe of like that a tight end is doing what he's doing as a blocker? Yeah. So I remember when he came out years ago and, um, when he was in Jacksonville, I was, I was coaching in Miami. I was, I was working as a skill development specialist and he was actually 
a player that I would show offensive tackles, I would show them his technique because I thought he was superior to like 99% of the offensive linemen as far as his footwork, his hand placement, his hat placement, his pad level, the way, I mean, just the way that he operates. He's so efficient in his movement. And um, he's a real, he's a treat to watch for me. He's the best in the business. He's been that way for years. There's guys now, George Kittle, Gronkowski's phenomenal as well, especially a couple of years ago when he was a little bit healthier. They're phenomenal, but he's been the best in the business for darn near 15 years now. And I think he's just an absolute treat to watch. And the thing that is phenomenal about him is now you see these two young guys come in the game and they, you can just tell that they benefit from the mindset that he comes in with. Right. And I, that's what I love about it. He's one of those guys, he's definitely passing the torch to 81 to 49. Those guys are, those guys are out there trying to do things the right way. They're they're what we call willing blockers, right? They're willing to come to the party. They want to dance. Yeah. And uh, I, I love that guy. I mean, I can't, I honestly couldn't say enough good things about him. I think Mercedes Lewis is just consummate pro. He would be, he would be a top pick on any team I was ever trying to formulate. Yeah, it, it's legitimately true. And I've never talked to anyone who has watched the tape consistently and not said that Mercedes Lewis is just a joy to watch each and every week. I've, I've pointed out on multiple occasions, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, where there will be times where, you know, because in, a, in so many play calls, you have a tight end that's maybe going to be the first blocker, and then maybe they're going to have a running back chip behind, or the tight end will start, and then the tackle will kind of kick back out and kind of help, where mm-hmm. there's that situation where the, the tackle is ready to kick out and help, or the running back's ready to be the next person to pick it up, and Mercedes is just like, ah, I got this. I'm, I'm just going to own this block one-on-one, and I don't need any of your help whatsoever. Whatsoever. I agree. I think there are, there is play from offensive linemen that I see on a week to week basis, not necessarily in green Bay, but where you watch and you're just like, man, like Mercedes Lewis has better technique um, on some of these than, than some offense. It's, it's really crazy to watch. Yeah. I'd argue that I'd, I would honestly argue that he's better than 70% of the tackles in the league. I'm, I'm happy you said that because I, yeah. I was almost going to say that. And I'm like, maybe this just sounds stupid because like, but I, I would like love to see just like maybe for like a handful of plays him at right tackle, just to, just for the sake of seeing it, because he's, like I said, he's just a joy to watch. And uh, it's really cool to hear that from you as well. I do want to pick your brain on a few different other offensive line topics, because of course this is your specialty. Uh, so before we get out of here, I want to start with David Bakhtiari returning from injury. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you've had an ACL injury. Am I correct in saying that? Not I just, my daughter just went through it. That's the closest I've gotten. Okay. Gotcha. But yeah. I'm sure you have had injuries throughout your career. I've worked with offensive linemen coming back for, from an ACL mm-hmm. injury. What, what does the mindset have to be for a David Bakhtiari, who's one of the most agile uh, tackles? It's one of the things that really makes him stand out. And now he's coming off of this really devastating ACL injury. He's going to have to cut and do all the different things and anchor. What's the mindset there for Bakhtiari, who could potentially be making his return against KC this week? So when you come back from any injury, the mindset is probably the most important thing because they're not going to put you out there until you're physically ready to go. And, and what's changed over the course of the last 15, 20 years is back in the day, the ACL was kind of, that was it. That was a grim reaper. You have an ACL, you're done. You're never going to be the same. And now it's just not the same. It's not the same outcome. Now you can come back and be, and be hundred percent. The way that you rehab has a huge impact on how you feel about yourself going in, right? Your preparation matters. And so, you know, as long as they're putting in kind of in their return to play model, you know, you get cleared by the doctor. Then you, then you start working with the, the physical therapist, the strength conditioning coach. You start going through your movement patterns. At some point, you have to integrate kind of 1v1 individual skills or position-specific skills into your rehab. And then now you can get start integrating back into practice so you don't lose that time. And, and, if, and if Bakhtiari just feels in practice like he can trust his knee, and that's going to be probably, especially this time during the season, that's something you're probably going to have to do outside of regular team practice because they're probably not going 100%. And you need to be able to train at that intensity level from his perspective to be able to trust that knee when you brace on it. When some, and then the first time somebody falls on it, all those things, if you can replicate that kind of off um, in a controlled environment, in a safe right. environment, you're going to feel so much better about it, right? But I think from, from Bakhtiari's standpoint, you're not going to feel, you're going to maybe feel some soreness that you didn't feel before. You know, a lot of times with injuries, what, what athletes will say is like, like I hurt my shoulder and it feels like you don't, your right arm really isn't yours for like a couple months, even though you're healthy and you're fine. It just doesn't feel like it's yours. Like it doesn't respond the way that it, you're used to. And so you kind of have to retrain it. And so it just depends on, 
on kind of his progression route where he is, but certainly I, he's such a valuable player that I can't imagine they don't let him play or excuse me, they don't, or they allow him to play unless he's 100% cleared. And so he's going to have the full you know faith and backing of the Green Bay Packers. And then so mentally he should be ready to go. Um, and again, the more work you get pre-game, the more work you get even pre-practice, you're going to feel that much better about it. Yeah, and you can just tell Green Bay's been taking extra, you know, care and caution. Not only putting him on the pup list to start the season, yeah. but he's obviously eligible to play coming back from the pup a couple of weeks ago. They've still taken their time. It still wouldn't shock me if they held him, maybe even until he got back in Green Bay and played at home. Like all of those things wouldn't surprise me. But they're going to make sure that you know he's 101 percent before they even remotely consider putting him out there. I love the fact that they've had that mindset with him, with him potentially coming back. That, of course, changes things for Elton Jenkins again. And everything's been written that can possibly be written about the fact that Elton Jenkins can play five spots along the offensive line. You've had some versatility in your career, but how is that from going to you know playing left tackle so far this season and now going back into left guard? And what have you seen from Jenkins that makes him so special that he can play all these different positions and, and be successful? Well, without knowing him, the first thing you'd say is he's extremely smart. Right. He's extremely smart and he's coming from a, like he's coming from a mindset where he's very comfortable in who he is and what he's able to accomplish. I think that's probably the most important thing that people don't think about athletically. He looks like he's very balanced. When you, when you see him move, he's, he's obviously a good athlete. He has good strength and agility. He's a very, very balanced player, um, which means his feet are always underneath him. Yeah. And the impressive part to me is to be able to, to be able to switch and then compete at a higher level. Usually you have some sort of drop off. He kind of looks to me, I think the, the guard position might be his number one position, but you put him at center, you put him at left tackle, he can kind of do all this stuff pretty well. It kind of reminds me of, of Mike Flanagan, who, who I was lucky to play with in, in yeah. Green Bay. He was, he was our starting center, and he was our top backup at left tackle. I mean, you just, some, some athletes just kind of have that, and a lot of it has to do with great bounce, great footwork, and incredible hand placement. And, if, and some guys just have better – we talked about Mercedes Lewis. Some guys have better hand placement than others, and those guys are usually the ones that are able to kind of move around easier. So Elton Jenkins has great hands, but number one, he's just got, he's just got a great sense of himself and he's just so confident in his ability to, to execute that. They call it self-efficacy, right? But he's just, he just has a belief that he can accomplish the goal. And, and I think that's the biggest hurdle that most athletes have to get over. Yeah. I was just going to ask you that, like how much of that is just mentality of being like, I don't care where you line me up. You line some up across from me and they're mm -hmm. trying to get to the quarterback. Like I'm, he's not getting there. That's my guy. And I'm going to block him. I don't care if I'm left side, right side, tackle guard center, just put somebody in front of me and I'm going to beat them up and they're not going to get to my guy. Yeah. It, it, mindset's 95. I mean, listen, the, the game's really played above the shoulders. We don't talk about that a lot because we spend so much time on everything else, but you know, the, the conquering your mind and, and the development of, of, of mindset is really the final frontier in sports. And some guys just get there faster than others. And he's certain, he certainly seems to be one of them. Yeah, another player that's been super fun to watch. The last one I want to ask you about is Royce Newman. Somebody mm -hmm. comes in fourth round rookie, starts right away, has had some success. They've kind of solidified him at right guard. Now it'll be interesting to see when Bakhtiari comes back, how that kind of shuffles out everything else. Yeah. Alton Jenkins could play right guard. They could move John Runyon Jr. to right guard. Um, I think Royce, there's a chance that Royce ends up being the odd man out and kind of ends up back on the bench, but we'll see. I really like Royce. I think he's not fully there yet. I think you'll see some lapses from time to time, but I see a lot of potential, but you're the expert in this realm. I would love to hear what you've kind of seen from, from Royce so far in the, the first half of his rookie season. Well, he certainly came in. Anytime you can start from day one as a rookie and, and, and perform well, I think you have that initial bump where everyone, the expectations were pretty low. He played well. The team was doing okay. Um, you know, he's had ups and downs as, as every rookie does, as every player does. And I've been really impressed. He clearly comes from a place at Mississippi where they're, they're well coached. He's playing against good competition every week. So he's kind of NFL. He's as NFL ready as you're going to get as far as the school you're coming from. Uh, for me, he probably is the odd man out. I think John Runyon Jr. has been the best guard on the team while mm -hmm. in this situation. So, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to figure out does John Run Jr. move over to the right guard? Does, does, does Elton, you just, I mean, to me, you solidify your left side a lot by putting your two best players there. And you know, you, when Bakhtiari comes back, you just move Jenkins back down to left guard. Maybe you, you ship John Runyon Jr. over because I just really think he brings a physicality and a demeanor that you just don't have along the line otherwise. Like when you take him out, it's always like you have to ask yourself the question. I know you asked about Royce and I think he's been doing a good job. But when I look at the offensive line, you kind of have to fill positions like you have your athlete at left tackle. Right. You have your brain power at center. And there's somewhere along the line. You have to have a guy who's like 
I'm that guy, dude. Like I'm, I'm going to come, I'm going to come get you. And if you take him out of that lineup, I don't know who that guy is. So that's why I would keep John Runyon Jr. in there. And not that these other guys aren't playing phenomenal. I think what Myers brings to the table is amazing as well. He's going to be, I don't know if he's the next Corey Lindsley because Lindsley was amazing and underrated for so many years of his career. But he's a, he's a phenomenal player. Um, I think Royce Newman has a great future in this league uh, this year. It'll be interesting to see if they want to, if they want to, take running or, 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 uh, or Royce off the field. But if it was me, I, I would keep, I would find a way to keep John Runyon Jr. on the field. I think he's been doing a phenomenal job. Last follow up on that. So it, it sounds like Josh Myers just recently had surgery. And if he comes mm-hmm. back, it sounds like it's going to be down yeah. the line. Now, would you consider just putting Elton Jenkins in at center, keeping John Runyon and, and Royce at their guard spots? And I putting think, Lucas? I think that's, I think that's a great idea. If you look at the, and I think I like the way Patrick plays, but if you're, if we're just being objective, he is the weak link on the weak link on that team right now, as far as the the offensive line position, he is the, he is the fifth rated offensive lineman in the starting five. I would, I would put Jenkins in in it center because he, we know he can perform there. Um, And again, we talked about his intellect already. So his ability to make all the, all the, all the checks and, and calls at the line of scrimmage, um, and then having that size body, that balanced body in there, being able to work with those two young players, I think would really be to benefit. Um, but it's too bad Myers isn't isn't in because I you, I just love to watch him develop, and I'm sure yeah. he'll get continue to develop in the next couple of years. But yeah, I think in the short term, you make a good point. That, that might be a position to to move the old left tackle back to center instead of the other way. Yeah, I think if you can have Bakhtiari at left tackle, not have to move Runyon because he has been playing really well at left guard, solidify that center position, keep Billy at right tackle. Then if you want to have a, a weekly competition between Lucas and Royce and figure out that, I think that could potentially make some sense. But I think that the beautiful thing is so many of these players have so much versatility, whether it's Billy Turner, Elton Jenkins, Lucas Patrick being able to play three spots in the interior, even Royce, I don't think they've done a ton with it yet, but he obviously comes from a tackle background in college. Yep. They played him at left guard right guard and right tackle and camp and in OTAs so so much versatility along that offensive line it just gives Matt LaFleur and Adam Stenovich so many options to kind of work with Mike this was our first time talking it was absolutely phenomenal where can we find you on Twitter and is there anything that you're working on that you'd like to plug yeah so you can hit me up on Twitter at unrivaled ESS or process to perform on Instagram I run a I run a podcast process to perform it's about it's a player development podcast Amon Green and I also run the on my block podcast awesome. we do that weekly for the believe network and so you can find those you know wherever you Apple Spotify iTunes or iHeartRadio. Uh, and then you know right now I just I run a, a player development program called total athlete development through that through that process to perform moniker so I work with athletes from professionals down to preteens trying to help them become elite and reach their ceiling um, anybody who's interested in that just hit me up at process to perform.com Awesome. Well, I'm super uh, looking forward to this moving forward. Uh, Tremendous stuff today. It should be a very entertaining game in Kansas City, regardless of who is there and who is starting. Should be fun to watch no matter what. We will touch base in a week. Thank you so much for joining me. For those listening, appreciate you as always. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.